Hello everyone, I think we are we live and that's the, the beginning of this uh, technical seminar hosted by NDTSS, where Tessia will be presenting some of its solutions. Before we start, uh, we've got Dr. Babu here, uh, who's the president of NDTSS, who's gonna say a few words as an introduction and then we'll uh, we'll start with the with the seminar. Yeah, hello everyone, good evening. Uh, on behalf of NDTSS, I would welcome everyone for this technical talk uh, co-hosted by uh, Testia. And I would like to thank the management of Testia uh, together with Ashwin who took the lead of initially come and approach me for this presentation. Um, the presentation is today is about uh, innovation transference from aerospace to cross industries. It's a very interesting talk. Uh, it's focus centered around uh, structural health monitoring uh, originally, it's been quite widely applied for aerospace industries, how we could bring down to other industries like process, oil and gas industries. This would be quite explained by our speaker. Um, I'd like to welcome Maxim, Maxim Belloc, uh, who is the technical sales Hi. manager from uh, Testia, who is uh, for the APAC region. Uh, Maxim is uh, having a, a mechanical engineering background, who is basically running the commercial activity here in Singapore. And uh, he will also guide, the, guide us for various solutions, uh, which uh, Testia specialists could uh, explain uh, into this uh, program. Feel free to keep your questions uh, live at the end of the session, and uh, you would have a Q&A box below, and you could be able to type in these questions, and we would be able to answer at the end of the day. Thank you very much, and welcome Testia group. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Babu. So um, th thank you very much for the introduction as well. So as you said, I'm the, I'm the technical sales manager for the APAC region. I'm calling you today from Singapore. And uh, I believe I, I've probably met some of the members of NDTSS because we are also member. So I might know some of you. Um, as you said, today we are uh, basically going to introduce some of the developments we've made, some of the in innovations we are working on as Testia. Testia initially is a company uh, because our affiliation to Airbus, we are very focused on uh, aviation, on aerospace. But uh, what we believe is that those innovation, those products we're working on can also be adapted to other industries, uh, to other use cases. And that's what we are going to discuss today. With me on the call, I've got uh, all a team of a big team of experts for all the different topics. So first, maybe the topics we different we, we're going to cover today. Uh, there's going to be four of them. The, the first one is what we call digital continuity. Uh, and I will have Teddy Canadas and Didier Simonet. So Teddy Canadas is the uh, chief commercial officer for Testia. Didier Simonet is the CEO of Testia. They will be talking about, about digital continuity. Second topic will be our solution for composites. And uh, we'll have Alexander Savinia, who is gonna, uh, who's calling us from, uh, from, from Spain, and he will be the one explaining basically those, those solutions. The third topic will be presented by Aswin uh, Haridas, who is the, the focal point for structural health monitoring, and uh, he's calling us from Germany today. The last and fourth topic will be uh, presented by Felix Schwark. Um, who is the IT manager and product owner for Smart Mixed uh, Reality. So that's going to that's be the four topics we will cover today. On the call, we also have Francisco Carrasco, who is our level three expert. Um, and uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So uh, please, if there's anything you want to ask, any topic that you think uh, you want to discuss, uh, write it down on the Q&A um, uh, window on, the, on your bottom right, and we'll answer it uh, at the end. So um, I think that's, that's basically uh, the gonna be the structure of, of, the, of today's seminar. And we can start right away with, uh, with Teddy Canadas and uh, Didier Simonet. So maybe before we, before we jump in the first topic, which is digital continuity, uh, I think we can have a few words from, from Didier. Uh, Didier Simone was the CEO of Testia Group. And uh, if you just want to give us your, your vision about Testia and what, what uh, basically what's innovation and what we, what we are working on. 
Uh, thank you, Maxime. Um, just a few, few words. Uh, uh, um, I'm Didier Simonet. I'm the former of Testia. And I've been the head of uh, the Airbus uh, Research Center in Toulouse during uh, 10 years. I'm, I'm working a lot on structuralist monitoring and uh, NDT. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm now here huh, to try to, uh, to, to explain a little bit what is uh, the added value of Testia on this uh, different topic. Uh, I, I also be uh, I'm former level two in uh, Ducurant and uh, and uh, Trasonic. Uh, I, I will try to uh, to to give my view little by little, but I'm not sure to understand really what is the goal at the end of the of this meeting. But I, I, I just will add my little expertise to the subject. If you want, Maxime, don't hesitate to uh, to ask me. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Didier. So uh, I guess now the, the floor is for is for Teddy. And uh, if I can just start with uh, with the first question, can you can you give us can you explain us? I, I mean, digitalization is a is a vast topic and is very well known in the industry. But can you give us your view on what is the digitalization and and more specifically digital continuity? Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Maxime and. Uh... Just before, allow me to uh, extend uh, this thanks to NDTS and Dr. Babu. Uh, I'm really happy to be there. And uh, at Testia, we are extremely happy about this partnership we have in, uh, in the region. Um, also, just before uh, answering uh, a few other words on Testia for our colleagues on the line, our uh, experts colleagues, level threes, which uh, don't know us so much from other industries. So you understood Testia, we are a uh, 100% Airbus company for 30 years. Um, about 30 years in the business uh, and our focus is really what we call structure integrity uh, and NDT which means that we uh, take care of topics from engineering and design up until manufacturing and in service uh, so we try to cover the full spectrum of NDT activities and uh, inspection uh, related topics from the procedures the design the feasibility studies up until the tooling the inspection uh, on the field. So our goal is really to make it seamless. And for Airbus, the strategy in having Testia is really so that we keep on investing into this exciting field uh, of NDT, which is always evolving to keep up with those technology in a fast way. This is what we've been trying to do uh, and what people like uh, Didier Simone have been doing for, uh, for their careers uh, to keep up with all of this and to constantly bring new ideas into the aerospace. Uh, because we realized that sometimes the standard solutions of the industry was not uh, adapted to our constraints, so we always adapted. That was probably the, uh, the uh, initial point. And just a last word on Testia, just so that you get the, the company uh, style. Uh, we are uh, about 400 employees worldwide uh, with uh, more, than, uh, what, uh, more than 100, 150 experts, level two, level threes, in all of the NDT, uh, NDT methods. So back on your question about digital continuity, uh, what is it about uh, and why is was it important for aerospace and transferable? Because in aerospace, like in many of your industries you may have on the line, we are uh, requested more and more to shorten the cycles, to be uh, more traceable in what we do and to save dual entries. So this is uh, why we connected the dots. So digital continuity is, uh, is about connecting the dots. And here today we are here to talk about NDT, right? So uh, digital continuity is very wide in all of the processes of uh, aerospace. But what we try to do for the past years is to focus on uh, digital continuity from detection of a defect up until uh, the reporting that will trigger potentially a repair. So between these two steps, uh, we have several uh, several actions of sizing, of localiza localization, assessment of the defects, etc. So between all of those steps, what we've been trying to do with digital continuity or what version 4.0 is to uh, transfer the data from one tool to another tool so that in the end, the reporting is automatic so that in the end, the decision making is eased and so that we have a full traceability. So that's uh, overall what uh, what digital continuity uh, aims about. Okay, 
And do we have any any practical example, any any use cases that you can explain maybe to illustrate what what you've been telling us? Sure. So uh, I'm going to try to share uh, the screen. Uh, if let me know if it's working, uh, which will show uh, a country, a concrete example or a few examples about what we do. Okay, we can see your screen now. Perfect. Okay, so just to give uh, up, this one is an example about um, about uh, a full scale uh, a full scale damage assessment. So let's imagine we have a dent on a, on an aircraft, a bird strike like you guys may have on the wind energy as well on the on the wind blade. We have uh, a lot of bird strikes, lightning strikes. Etc. So which can create dents or delaminations on composites, etc. So let's say it starts with an impact. Uh, we have tools. We have developed tools uh, to uh, detect this impact. Sometimes as an expert, sometimes in a go-to-go -go manner. Alexander will explain this further. Uh, here, for instance, we have a UTPA uh, ultrasonic phase array set. So we use our first digital tools uh, to capture the data and, as we can, evaluate it in a go-to-go -no -go manner. Uh, as a, for dense as well, we have other tools for using optical technologies to uh, detect also in a very quick way, is it a dent, is it deep, what is its size, etc. So the first steps here are with a few tools, which are then sharing the data with a common database. Uh, these tools are also connected with locating tools. Whenever we detected an incident, we, we pre-sized it or we sized it. We have another tool like this one, or we have a version for using augmented reality, you will see later, all the lenses, uh, where we can measure the localization of uh, this impact. And we are lucky in aerospace to have the digital mock-up of all of our newest airplanes, so we can map uh, uh, the localization, the coordinates uh, of this defect in the digital mock-up. So here I have tools to pre-assess, detect, size, localize, and all of these tools using the same tablet very often will share this data to uh, a backbone database, uh, which we developed for Airbus and with Airbus called uh, 3D Repair, for instance, uh, which will map on the digital mockup the defects and allow a management of the defects. Here I can see, for instance, uh, delamination on the composite uh, structure, uh, which was directly imported from the previous tools. Uh, and the beauty of this and the advantage of this digital continuity here is that by having this data, which is the size and the precise localization, uh, the tool uh, is mapping it with the adequate documentation and uh, procedures, which means concretely uh, by knowing where the defect is here, uh, I can just click and open uh, the right manual at the right place, which will tell me, okay, this is allowable, or this is something you have to repair, and this is how you have to repair it. So the time saving you can imagine is uh, is huge, and uh, the the risk of mistakes as well is uh, is avoided. So that's a, in a nutshell uh, a concrete example of uh, of digital continuity that we've been developing uh, and which is uh, running uh, at the moment uh, uh, within uh, our industry. Okay, so I think I think that's a good example. But um, this one is is kind of focused on what on our, our basically main activity, which is aviation. Um, how would you say this could be translated and applied to different industries? You mentioned maybe a wind wind industry, or mm. uh, how how do you see that applied in other fields? Mm. Yeah, so we we uh, we've been working with uh, other industries. Uh, even though our primary focus is aerospace, even there we work with oil and gas, we work with naval industry, with uh, wind energy. Uh, what we see is that we share very similar spirit and constraints around uh, zero risk, around cost reduction, around excellence, around quality. So these constraint, constraints, in the end of the day, come down to having the data, the right data, uh, data we can trust. So I think a similar process is applied already with uh, drones to detect defects in uh, wind energy, like we do also in aerospace. So we think we can bring those bricks to such industries uh, and go maybe a little bit deeper 
uh, in Airbus, for instance, we have a lot of constraints on mapping the defects, on characterizing the defect, uh, what is the type of defect, what is the size. So we worked a lot on automate, uh, automatizing it, uh, also in the manufacturing process, uh, as we have a lot of, uh, of redundant uh, troubles, they always are the same. So we developed, you will see later, softwares, which are like NDT kit, which are automatically detecting a defect, sizing a defect, recognizing what sort of defect it is. So we think this sort of bricks of intelligence, of uh, software intelligence, we can bring to other industries, customize them, put them into this digital continuity uh, to bring these target, uh, these targets of uh, traceability and, uh, and quality. Okay, understand. Um, so if I if I just rephrase what you say, basically we, we have a, a range of tools, whether it's a software or it's a acquisition equipment, and they kind of in that digital continuity environment, they all kind of talk together, gather data, and allow for more um, traceability, more more efficient efficiency, uh, and those use cases could then be adapted to other industries because uh, essentially an NDT inspection uh, is, is in a similar process in a different field with different specifications maybe, but could be adapted. Um, so essentially, what would you say is the, is the benefit of the uh, digital continuity ecosystem? Yeah, I think we, we touched base on, uh, on a few of them. Uh, probably for aerospace and transferable to other industries, the main benefit in the end of the day is cost reduction. Uh, by making, putting in place this digital continuity, we are avoiding a lot of uh, dual entries and also a lot of potential rework after because we will see the defect as they go uh, and we, uh, we keep track of them. What happens sometimes when we have a big airplane and uh, I'm guessing it's the same for a big uh, wind blade or a big, uh, uh, a big pipe uh, for oil and gas, Sometimes we don't know, we don't have the traceability, the paper traceability of what was done, what was inspected, and we re-inspect again a suspicious area uh, very often. So by having this sort of digital continuity in place, uh, we know what is what is reported, we know that we know what still needs to be sorted out. So uh, I think the cost saving aspect is a strong one uh, to avoid these dual entries and the robustness of this overall inspection process, uh, thanks to the traceability uh, and the quality. Uh, maybe uh, also Didi, I'm sure can complement uh, and so on, but for me, that's the main one. Yeah. Okay, understand. All right, so, and, and possibly digitization could be a bit frightening for some companies because uh, it's a, it could be a long process, could be, there's a lot of change management here, so, how how would you say uh, would work a typical implementation of this this digital uh, environment? Mm. Yeah, I think the the key is to go step by step to identify the small wins uh, which are bringing a difference. And this is what what we've done uh, to identify small use cases. Like for the drone, we focused first uh, uh, on a lightning strike, for instance, etc. So the goal is really to, to take use cases that are bringing uh, that are recurrent in the business and uh, to tackle them on. So that will be probably would be one of the keys. And another key is to is that we have Lego bricks which are our full IP uh, which we own completely. So we are fully uh, on our hands to customize. And as we customize them for our needs, we can customize them for other needs. So the goal would be to work together on project mode, customizing these bricks towards uh, our colleagues' objectives, and in the end, uh, getting it. Okay, I think I think that would be one of our main strengths is that if anyone in the audience or basically anyone from a different industry had a typical use case he wants to work on because we fully develop those solutions and because we have the we are fully owners of the solutions we can easily adapt adapt them to a different uh, industry or different use case mm -hmm. yeah. uh, i think we we've covered it uh, quite well here um if you is there anything you want you wanted to to add teddy or or maybe didier is there anything you want to add to that to that section
Yeah, I think uh, I think we we've been around. Uh, we covered uh, it on an helicopter view. Uh, now in the next uh, part, uh, we will be uh, going into more details about the bricks that can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, my last message would be that those bricks were developed in a very robust manner as well uh, as uh, we we know uh, for aerospace uh, these constraints are quite strong, and I believe we share the same values with this audience today. This uh, NDT mm -hmm. expertise values. Uh, are shared across uh, several industries. So these bricks, even though they will require work to be customized, that's for sure. It's not going to be uh, from one day to the other. I'm sure uh, having the same objectives, we can customize them quite seamlessly uh, and bring value to uh, to your business in other industries. Also, my last message is that we are all in this COVID situation where that we have to face. It's a new reality. Uh, and this is also why we are here today. Uh, you know, our industry is suffering quite quite a lot. Uh, I'm sure yours industries are, are hit as well quite badly. So our goal is to uh, uh, work together to see uh, what we can learn from each other and to see what we can bring to other industries and what we can learn from other industries. Uh, and it's, it's a time for, uh, I'm sure, across uh, learnings and cross solidarity uh, at this point. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much, Teddy. Um, so uh, I think that was quite a, a, a put that puts it in a nutshell. Uh, if if there is any question from the audience, you can you can start writing it down. What we'll do is we'll select the questions and we'll answer it uh, at the end during the Q and A session. But feel free to write them down uh, from now or all along the presentation. So that's the end of the first first topic which was digital continuity and what value it could bring to to aviation and to other industries as well which could lead us to, to lead us to the the second topic of the day which are basically the, the solutions we are we develop for composite inspections and uh, and today we have alexander Savignat calling us from spain is the sales representative the sales manager for the for spain and um um, it, it, it deals a lot with this kind of topic uh, with composite material. So uh, we'll have that, we'll have him today presenting uh, those solutions. So maybe Alexander, can you can you explain us a bit what we have? What are our solutions? Can you explain to the audience what we have developed for composite inspections? Yes, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I would could you please uh, pass me the ball so that I can uh, showcase. Uh, some of those uh, solutions uh, dedicated to the uh, composite uh, composite world. Um, please, Teddy, could you give me the ball so that I can share uh, my content? Or maybe Airbus uh, host? Um, well, anyway, uh, just to to go on, uh, the I guess the, the presentation will come on later on. Uh, I will structure my explain my the solutions that we have uh, from Testia in uh, let's say three domains. So uh, the first one uh, being uh, softwares, uh, we have also uh, dedicated tools for specific applications, and uh, then I would say like uh, like Teddy talked before the the technological bricks that are required to um, customize and create any kind of. Uh, a solution in the NDT world. Um, so to, to begin with uh, the, the software on, on Testia, we have uh, is called NDT Kit. So it is a uh, post processing uh, software uh, once the acquisition has been made. Uh, thanks to the uh, advanced uh, level of the software, it is able to once well parameters to um, make uh, the, um, an automated defect detection, uh, then it can also uh, go up to automated analysis and finish with automated reports. So uh, just as you can see now uh, on my screen shortly, um, so this is uh, entity kit uh, UT uh, for ultrasonic. We have also the, the similar one uh, with uh, radiography uh, technique. So yeah, the, to uh, to summarize the points of uh, those softwares is to uh, assist the entity experts during production to avoid uh, their uh, to use their valuable time uh, into uh, poor production 
uh, into creating a, a solution that will boost productivity instead of having to do all this uh, manually. So um, then if we uh, go on to the, the next uh, domain that we have, it would be the dedicated tools uh, for specific applications. So here you can see uh, two of the dedicated tools for composite applications that have been uh, created specifically for uh, finding delim delamination on the A350. So you might wonder why only now and why not for other planes? Well, simply because A350 uh, was the, the, the plane that had most uh, composite. Um, it's up to 53% and almost all of the fuselage is made of composites. So it presented for a new problem that uh, wasn't existing uh, during the, when planes were mostly metallic, is that when you have a, a shock, an impact on the metallic plane, you will see directly uh, the problem and uh, you have methods to size it. Whereas on the composite structure, you might be uh, a bit of, uh, of paint getting uh, torn, off, torn away, but you can't uh, get a, a grasp of the damage that is behind. You can have uh, from a small delamination to a huge delamination that will impact the whole uh, structure's integrity. So uh, the DLAM tool that you see on your left uh, is a go-no-go no go, uh, tool that is uh, using a roller probe and that can be uh, handled by any technicians. You don't need uh, NDT, uh, an NDT expert to perform the routine inspection. You can focus then your NDT time as well your entity valuable expert time elsewhere. So this tool will is on a go no go manner, meaning that uh, the, the technician will uh, spray water on the structure and then uh, roll on the, the probe to um, see if there is a, a, a green go, then it means that the, there is no defects found. And if there is a red cross with a no go, this means you'll have to size the defect that there is manifested. So to size the defects, we'll go to the line sizing solution, which is also a tool that uh, requires no NDT expertise. Um, this tool will allow for uh, the sizing of the defect. It will uh, take out uh, a, a, the mapping of the defect with uh, a simple uh, automated roller probe check and uh, a quick and, um, and step-by-step calibration process. Uh, then this tool will render an automated report allowing for the technician to perform uh, the task and size the defects on it. In the end, those tools are very specific to tasks and they uh, help save valuable time of experts, avoid them uh, going uh, from side to side and keep them on their uh, expertise and uh, away from routine tasks. So we have other dedicated solutions that are more dedicated for manufacturing. Um, this, uh, these dedicated solutions are manufactured by in factory at the company. For example, the first one that uh, they are developing is the automatic fiber placement monitoring system, which is a online monitoring system, meaning that you have the automatic fiber placement machine that is uh, placing the fibers uh, on a uh, composite structure well, the fibers of a composite structure. And while the machine is working, you have uh, the system that is monitoring its placement to find any uh, misplacement, any error that would have uh, been made by the machine, avoiding the uh, complete uh, process being uh, done, then the, the part being cured, and to only find after a huge uh, inspection process that your part is not good for go. So this saves uh, uh, about 95% uh, time on inspections. Uh, so it's quite, uh, quite huge. The, the second uh, online monitoring system that they have is the, the cure and flow front monitoring. Uh, so it's obviously not for parts that are using pre-preg, but for parts that, are, uh, that have a resin injection. So uh, while the, the problem would be uh, if while you're injecting the resin and curing the parts, you might uh, add too much resin or cure for too long because you would be afraid that if you don't overdo it, then you would have parts, you would have zones within your parts that are lacking uh, this resin or that are under cured. So this means you spend too much time, too much money uh, on uh, curing and resin. Well, this capture that is one millimeter thick goes all around parts and 
goes to monitoring the, the flow front of the resin and the curing level of the parts. In this way, you can stop the, the autoclave process as soon as it's cured and you know that your part is entirely covered with resin. Um, so now I'll transition to the third domain um, that we, third domain of, uh, of um, solutions that we have uh, in Testia for composites, that's, I would say, would be the technological bricks. Um, those are essential for uh, building um, robust and um, cost uh, effective solutions. Uh, so we have the Smart U32 acquisition box, which is a 32 elements phased array acquisition system. Then we have also the mono elements ultrasonic and uh, eddy current acquisition system. It uh, makes both methods uh, for, for single element uh, acquisition. Uh, the last technological bricks uh, that we have is the, the smart scan, uh, which is a reliable and flexible scanner with, we, with, we believe, the best value price ratio on the markets. Uh, it is um, in short for uh, easy and accurate acquisition. Um, yeah, so I guess this summarizes the different solutions that we have uh, in three domains, the softwares, the dedicated tools and solutions and technological bricks. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. So th there was a, there's a, what we've just seen is a, is a whole range of solutions for composite inspection. They all have, I would say, different purposes and uh, different, uh, they've all been used in a different way. Some of them are for inspections or during, uh, during what's say maintenance. Some of them are for manufacturing. Some of them are for both. And from what it looks like here, the, uh, the dedicated solutions, because, because that's their definition, They're, they've been developed for a certain purpose. So they, uh, they meet and re the requirements of a certain task, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say the others would be easily translated to a different field, right? Well, um, yes, uh, even though you would take the, you would think the dedicated tools uh, might be limited. Uh, you can see here uh, a very uh, the use that they have. Uh, if you take the DLAM tool, uh, it is used for wide and fast elimination inspection inspection coverage with the speed of one square meter per minute. So you can uh, quickly envision the size of uh, the inspection that can cover the tool. So even though it has a limited application, it does this application very well. So that's the, the purpose of those tools. And then you can envisage uh, some uh, adaptations from those tools since the tool has already been designed. It is just a question of adapting it to uh, another use cases that needs a quick, uh, a fast inspection. We could think of like the, the blades of uh, wind farms of, uh, of uh, wind turbines that uh, uh, occur with, uh, with bird strikes or any damage that can occur during the transport. Well, we could translate a tool like this to find the delaminations on uh, such a such huge uh, part. So, okay. even for those... Yes? For, sorry, yeah, I was about to say that for, for this DLAM tool and for this line sizing, one of the main interests would also be that you don't actually need an NDT certification. So let's say that if in uh, in different industries, uh, would be probably similar than aviation, where NDT qualified personnel is not a very uh, common resource and it's sometimes hard to find. So one of the main interests here would be to, uh, if, if there was a need, if there was another use case, you could uh, we could work with with this uh, with another company to develop these tools to meet another purpose. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that's one of the reasons within aviation why uh, uh, it was uh, designed for technicians that have no NDT certification. Because as I guess in other industries, NDT certification is long, is costly. So obviously the personnel uh, who has and meets those, uh, this expertise is rare. So this mm. is uh, also the, the, the same, uh, I guess uh, another use those dedicated uh, tools for specific applications. Okay, how about the uh, you, the first product you mentioned is the NDT kit software. So uh, if I recap, that's basically a, a software platform 
that can work with different NDT technologies like ultrasonic, uh, infrared thermography, and uh, do a lot of, of things like uh, analysis, reporting, post-processing. So would that easily work with, uh, with other industries as well? Well, um, I'll, I'll show you the, the next slide that I have prepared, which uh, I will explain uh, better the, how it can translate to other industries. The, if right. we couple the software, uh, the ultrasonic software that we have in DT kit to the technological bricks that we have, we can create uh, an, a fast and, uh, and cheap, uh, well, not cheap, not costly because cheap seems bad, not costly in automated inspection for small to medium production size. This means that you take the uh, Smart 232 uh, precision box plus the Smart Can, you get an automated uh, inspection solution. You couple that with the NDT kit software and you get an automated inspection with the final report, with the automated detection, with the automated analysis. So there you have your uh, automation at uh, your fast, easy and accurate automation at a, uh, uh, an easy cost. And then obviously, uh, if we go further, uh, we can see a uh, customized uh, UT machine using also uh, NDT kit, also the U32 box, but there you customize the machine to meet the demand. Uh, so, for example, here we have a machine that is semi-automatic, uh, full immersion on contact, and allows for a high productivity at an affordable price. Um, right. Still with the so, assisted software, assisted reporting. So, and, yep. so, so in short, we, we can provide the machine, whether it's, uh, it's the smart scan, which is an off-the-shelf uh, machine, or it could be any kind of uh, specifically made machine. We can provide the acquisition box, which is the small 232, the, basically the hardware part, which, which would have the sensors and everything. And, and we can provide the software and the whole solution combined would basically be able to inspect any kind of composite parts uh, and do an automated inspection, an automated reporting, and would record and trace everything. Yes? Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, that's the... That's where uh, I wanted to go, actually, is to show that in the end, the, the problem is not the industry. It's not like, okay, we're working in the aeronautical industry, so here's our solutions. The point is to show that actually the question is about the part that has to be inspected. Uh, so this machine allows for an inspection of uh, A350 frames. Uh, it has a very high productivity of one minute per linear meter. And then we have uh, we can go up until this fully autonomous machine, which will get the blade uh, that has been inserted uh, on the right side. The KUKA robot will then take the blade, put it on the inspection stand, and both in pulse co and through transmission will inspect the blade. So as you can see, uh, all those solutions inspect very different parts. The only thing they all have in common is the fact that they are composite parts. So really the, the question is about, about what has to be done rather than from what industry, uh, in which industry it is supposed to perform. Okay, so here basically the way to implement those solutions would be to work on a, on a project mode and uh, having requirements coming from a customer and adapting our solution to this kind of inspections, yes? Yeah, exactly. Uh, as uh, Teddy said, we can work in Lego mode, which is just uh, putting together the different uh, off-the-shelf uh, uh, technological bricks that we have. And we can also work in project mode to adapt uh, the dedicated tools already existing to specific applications and uh, work in full, uh, let's say, prepare a full autonomous machine. And this would imply uh, Testia can help on this point uh, to help attain this uh, full industrialization solution. They can help from the feasibility study, from the uh, design uh, up uh, to the procedure writing and all the way into the certification procedures and the uh, productivity ready uh, solution. Mm. Okay, so here the main benefits would be 
productivity increase and uh, thanks to the automation of the task and the uh, reliability because the, the, the inspection is also and the analysis is automated, the reporting is done so there's no longer, uh, I mean, removes the major part of the human error, error as well. Is that, is that correct? Yes, exactly. Uh, you get, thanks to this, the traceability, the uh, reliability, you know that your production will keep the same uh, time uh, uh, for every inspection. So you okay. really, you transfer the NDT uh, knowledge, the NDT experts knowledge from a, a repetitive uh, task into an advanced and uh, using uh, more in depth his, uh, his NDT knowledge. Okay, Th thank you very much, Alexander. I think we, we've covered the subject. Maybe is, if, if there's anything you want to add before we move on to the, to the next subject. No, that's perfect. Thank you for okay. having me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for presenting the solutions. So, uh, of course, composite material present different challenges and, and that's, that's good that we, we, uh, we develop some of the solutions to answer this, these challenges. If there's any question regarding these topics, once again, feel free to ask them in the Q&A section and, uh, and we'll answer it uh, at the end. Um, so let's move on to the third topic of the day with uh, Mr. Aswin Haridas, who's uh, calling us from Germany, is the, is the focal point for topic related to structural health monitoring. Uh, and he, he will today be the, the speaker regarding that topic. Mm -hmm. um, so some of you might know him actually because he was previously in Singapore. So, and, and he was the one uh, initiating the discussions with Dr. Babu to organize this this webinar. So uh, uh, welcome, Aswin, and uh, you. maybe if you just uh, could explain us a bit what structural health monitoring means and what uh, what we are working on, what topics we, we're developing. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Max, and uh, I would also like to thank uh, all the panel members, uh, Dr. Babu, for getting the event possible, and all the participants who attended uh, amidst uh, the late hours in Singapore. Thank you so much to all. Uh, so yeah, as uh, you rightly pointed, Max, I would be talking a little about uh, structure health monitoring solutions um, that we have, uh, um, starting with a, a key idea about what structure health monitoring really is. And maybe I think I have a very good descriptive slide maybe that I can, I can share and you probably would be able to see the same now. Yes. Uh, so structure health monitoring, essentially, you can um, create an analogous idea with the human body uh, where we think of a human nervous system that is exactly what structure health monitoring um, system is for any object in this case an example of an aircraft is shown uh, basically the key idea or the key difference from ndt is that uh, instead of having the sensors um, um, you know you inspect the parts one after the other maybe in intervals here in structure health monitoring you integrate the sensors along with the parts so that you are continuously monitoring the part uh, over a period of time, collecting a lot of data. And if you are able to um, you know, obtain useful information from this collected data, you are able to identify how the structure behaves uh, or has behaved. And you can sort of make a prediction as well how the structure would behave. And that's, that's the, the essential idea of structure health monitoring. Uh, from an aircraft perspective, um, the, the key benefit that, that structure health monitoring uh, brings to the table is the reduction in cost, because then you, you're trying to uh, imagine uh, lesser requirements in benefits, uh, sorry, uh, in maintenance uh, uh, inspections, and you, you're, you're obtaining data thoroughly over a long period of time. Uh, but I think this this is also a key benefit for other industries, and I I believe that for other industries, structure health monitoring adds more value than aviation at this is at this point of yet for, of time. Yeah. Okay, so uh, how, okay, can you maybe give us more more data information on how how the system works and if if that works. Uh, what what has been developed for for aviation and what could be developed for for other other industries as well? Sure, sure. I, I, uh, within test here, we have this. Uh, let's say we can imagine it as a sensor based model for structure health monitoring, where we think of different sensors doing different duties. Let's say, 
uh, and you can divide it into main three pillars. So the first pillar is condition monitoring. So essentially any sensor network that is monitoring the condition of that object at any given time, like for example, strains or temperature, humidity would come under this category of sensors. Yeah, uh, this is attached onto the structure. The second pillar would be on damage detection. So for for example, any sensor network that can actually detect um, a crack on a pipeline, for example, or it could be a, a damage on a, a, a infrastructure, a bridge uh, or a wind turbine uh, rotor blade uh, could fall into this category. And the third category is a process monitoring. So you can you can also get an idea of the, the, the health of the structure by analyzing the process in which it was manufactured or it has been used or maintained yeah so from our standpoint uh, from aviation to the other industries we can look at each of these critical um, areas like manufacturing or uh, in service or maintenance and we can define different solutions um, so we have a huge portfolio of sensors uh, uh, that we we target and i can i can go into the use cases as well uh, uh, soon, but um, the, the key principle is that we have a lot of uh, um, sensors that come in our portfolio, which which we look at in aviation uh, that we can easily adapt uh, depending upon uh, the industry, uh, depending upon the, the process uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. If I if I basically phrase it in a, in a non expert way, which which is what I want, uh, it basically means that we are uh, able to anticipate uh, a potential failure that will occur uh, and we are that we are able to predict basically so so essentially I, I guess this uh, there's, there's there are a lot of different use cases in in various type of, of industry right yeah that's right that's right and maybe I can I can talk a little bit about this yeah so essentially mm -hmm. Uh, I believe you would be able to see the slide which shows different yes. use cases. But before going into each of these use cases, I can give you an overview about the, the kind of sensors that we are looking at, or let's say um, uh, overview of the sensors. So we look at different sensors, sensors that are based on sound. So you have acoustic emission sensors, you have acoustic ultrasonic sensors, uh, you have sensors that are based on light, for example, uh, optical fibers, which essentially detect temperature and strain. Um, uh, then you have uh, different conventional sensors, like you have the strain gauge and the thermocouples. So from our side, from Testia, uh, we offer this wide range of solutions because we are connected to different OEMs, different part partners globally, where we can bring in these solutions uh, depending upon the use case and then, you know, sort of combine them, um, sort of provide it as a toolbox application. Um, I, I would like to imagine it that way, that we have a toolbox with different solutions which you can take and apply. And here you, you can see several use cases, uh, some of which we, we are doing thoroughly, which is probably our priority at the moment, and some of which we are also are planning in the future. So here we have been working with the aviation industry a lot with conventional structure health monitoring sensors, like the strain gauges or the thermocouples, uh, because most of the kind of uh, information required from the aviation sector is defined by these conventional sensors but this is not true when we go into uh, let's say the case of a wind turbine or a or a infrastructure uh, like a bridge so in germany here we have a lot of old bridges and we are working with a lot of uh, our customers even now uh, to install acoustic emission sensors which are based on sound so you have a you're sort of listening to a crack being formed yeah so you, it's a sensor that's like a piezo sensor and you're listening to any defect that is formed and propagated and the, by listening to this, you can do it over a period of time. So it, it can work as a passive sensor. So it, it just, when it listens, it triggers, um, um, or you get a message, for example. And we, we are installing it as we speak. So now we are undergoing this process of installing such sensors. For wind turbine applications, we work with conventional structure health monitoring sensors, as well as, you know, adapted sensors for large 80 meter long blades. Yeah, So we are uh, working towards installing different types of sensors uh, in combination to, to optimize the in-service performance of, of uh, wind turbine uh, blades itself. Uh, furthermore, I think we have a lot of uh, other applications like automotive applications and composite applications. Um, we have these sensors, which is the comparative vacuum monitoring sensors. Essentially, it's, um, uh, it's tubes of 
air and vacuum. And if there's a crack that is generated, it disturbs the vacuum. And by knowing how much vacuum has been reduced, you make a judgment of the defect. And lastly, I think one of the key areas that we are working on right now is also for space applications, because we are also um, we are in the Airbus environment and we have a lot of partners who work in uh, aerospace as well as non aerospace. And yeah, so this this gives you an idea that structure health monitoring is not um, an aerospace thing. Yeah, it's it's broadly um, uh, can be utilized very well by other industries if properly utilized. And in all of this thing, uh, as you mentioned previously, the prediction of how the structure behaves uh, purely de depends on the data that is collected. If the data that is collected is something that is uh, very good, let's say, and this is to be assessed by experts, uh, and you are able to make very good informational um, information gathering from this data you're definitely you can uh, predict what happens to the structure after let's say six months and as an example yeah okay and so then i i guess that by predicting what will happen to the structure we are able to uh, uh, anticipate potential repairs to prevent downtime that's right uh, and, and basically that that results in maybe productivity improvements and i guess as well cost reduction right yeah, that's the that's the key aim. Yeah, so I think structure health monitoring was initiated with this uh, aim, uh, and I think it started with the aviation industry. But I believe now a lot of other industries are adapting it, or would like to adapt it because of the same reason for reducing costs. Okay, so so if we had to implement the solutions, uh, you you already mentioned that it could it's not only aviation; it could be adapted that's anywhere. Right. So uh, we would we would basically provide the sensors, whichever they are, by, by basically providing the relevant sensors and uh, all all the data analytics part as yep. well, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and the interpretation as well. Yeah, that's correct. So for, for from my perspective, I, I would imagine that test year's role uh, for structural health monitoring spans the entire process chain. So we can, we can uh, start with any customer from different industries, we can start talking about the application scenario like today, where we where Testia would work with the customer, uh, let's say from the oil and gas industry or be it the infrastructure industry, to define uh, and analyze the business case, to come up with the the understanding of how structure health monitoring monitoring can really benefit um, uh, their application uh, that, that comes across. Um, further, once this is identified, yeah, once we identify the role of structure health monitoring, Testia also works with the customer to define the the sensor technology that is that is key to to solve this problem, uh, uh, which is the best sensor. How can it fit? Can we combine different sensors together to uh, to provide the best solution? Uh, what is the maturity level of the solution itself? Uh, the deliverable on this this aspect from Testia would be like a benchmarking report. Let's say for for a uh, for the customer to have a good overview on different solutions that we have investigated in. Uh, then we. Uh, in order to perform this benchmarking, we are connected with different suppliers and partners worldwide. And as I previously mentioned, Max, we have we consider this to be a toolbox application. So we are like a toolbox with different solutions in this toolbox. And essentially what we are doing is trying to fit the right tools for the right uh, requirements. And that is something that we, uh, we follow to get the, the perfect solution uh, for the customer. Um, in case, um, there is a solution which is highly of interest, but it's not mature enough for that particular application or requirement. We are also able to provide the maturation uh, capability where we can mature the technology based on the needs of the customer to, uh, let's say, a TRL 6 or a TRL 9. And, and, and depending upon the use case, we can sort of uh, play around with this aspect and uh, make sure that the customer is satisfied with the final uh, sensor uh, solution. That said, once this is identified, we choose the sensor. We are also able to provide the services of installation where we go globally at any location, any type of uh, technology, any different sensor technologies, and we are able to go and install the sensors. Like right now, we are installing acoustic emission sensors on a bridge uh, near, near I mean, in Hamburg you know, here in Germany. And so we are we can do the service in a global scale. 
Uh, once these sensors are installed, we also provide like a functional check on all of these sensors to make sure they are they function all right. When you this is uh, very important when you have more than one sensor, when you have hundreds of sensors, let's say on a bridge, um, and we we make sure that we protect these sensors in case there's uh, issues of rain or any other aspects that come into the the picture. Um, once everything is done, we make sure that we document this procedure, the, the work procedure that we have followed. We make sure that the customer is aligned with us 100%. They really know there's no black box here. Uh, we are very uh, open with regards to the procedure that we follow, and this is definitely provided to the customer for future reference. Um, and also, we provide the post. Uh, installation services, which is basically repair and maintenance in case um, there are some issues with any of the sensor, with any of the wiring aspects and so on and so forth. So this sort of covers uh, a good range. But once, um, uh, like previously, like I previously mentioned for predicting the, the health of a structure, for example, it's very important to really analyze the data that is collected from the sensor. And so apart from applying the sensor and choosing the right sensor, we also provide um, um, services for collection of data and analysis of data. So here we provide in situ collection. So if you have a sensor on a bridge 300 kilometers away from you, you still can get the data because we provide the service to get the data from that location to your location. Um, further, we collect them, we store them, we analyze them, and we make uh, our diagnosis along with the, the Airbus Data Analytics Center. And then we also obviously keep the customer updated. So the customer will be in the loop for all of these processes. Okay. And if the data collection is broad enough and we are able to make some judgments, we can make some predictive models to determine the health of the structure, how the, the, the structure is progressing, and what is the lifetime um, of the structure itself. Um, in case the, um, so this is basically the entire service that we provide, which, which you can imagine is the entire process chain for, for all the different uh, industries here. Yeah? Uh, but I would also like to add that from our side, we also provide consulting services because each of these um, segments or pillars previously mentioned can also be thought as one separate pillar. And if a customer would like uh, for us to be an advisor for e individual segments, we can also act, uh, work together with them uh, to help them out and be as a be a consultant uh, working in parallel with the customer. Uh, it, it's it's pretty much like a Lego or a puzzle. Yeah, so we are we are we are basically bringing different aspects together to solve the puzzle and we look at application. We look at all the different requirements. Uh, we look at the maturation aspect, the installation services. Uh, yeah, in summary, we work closely with the customer, making sure that all the requirements are properly understood. The wish lists are very clear. Once it's very clear, we choose the right sensors based on an analysis, uh, install them, uh, collect the data, provide information from the sensors, yes. So so in, in short, this is this is the kind of, uh, uh, of service, of solution that requires a, a very uh, dedicated environment analysis and to be sure to select the right technologies and the right way to operate it. Uh, so what, what you just said is that basically we can provide the whole range of uh, services, of solutions to implement uh, structural health monitoring on different use cases. Yep. Um, so uh, I guess one, one question that comes to my mind is that uh, this, this definitely this probably has a cost and, and would you say that the benefits coming from implementing structural health monitoring would uh, easily cover the, the investment in, the initial investment from from the implementation absolutely i, I think uh, more than me saying it i think we have uh, some of our customers who who come to talk to us and when we when we work together with the customer to try and understand the benefits of structural health monitoring for their application let's say a bridge uh, they they thoroughly find that the benefits definitely overpower the costs. Uh, this is basically because one, you are installing fundamental sensors. They are not super high costly sensors, but the amount of data or the information that you gain out of the sensor about the structure as a whole is so high that you can make so much of uh, 
better predictions, reduce the amount of manpower to do intermittent uh, inspections. Um, um, I can give you an example for a wind turbine. Yeah, so an offshore wind turbine, which is located um, offshore. Yeah, uh, and to inspect these wind turbines, they have fixed seasons, so they do not go to this uh, to the wind turbine during the winter season because uh, of the weather and conditions like these and they choose a particular time of the year to do the inspection so from our side they are they are sort of having a blind spot during a time of the year where they don't know what is happening on their wind turbine and from what we do with the sensors that are installed on these wind turbines we are providing them the eyes to see what's happening on there when they are not even present there so they don't have to do this inspection over and over again but we are this this sensors that are installed are providing them all the data that is uh, necessary to uh, to to um, you know for them to take an action if necessary yeah all right okay uh, and and will will this the sensor and this system implemented require a lot of maintenance or is it kind of self sustained and, and works by itself? Uh, most of the sensors uh, work by itself. Work like for example, you have sensors. Most of the sensors come with uh, batteries or solar panels uh, that can actually power by itself. It's it, it's wireless. Some of the sensors are wireless. Some are wired. Uh, it depends on the use case. Yeah, uh, the choice of all of these parameters uh, and the sensors once uh, installed, once um, uh, protected, once ensure that it, it works it can stay there for a long time so we have uh, right now we are working with suppliers or sorry with the customers where we we install sensors for a period of at least six months and for these six months these sensors are by itself and we don't have to we may have to do some checks but we don't have to uh, thoroughly do inspections on them okay okay right thank you thank you very much aswin uh so much. if you if you just if you have anything to add you, you, uh, to, to that topic, uh, please feel free. And then, then we'll move on to the, to the next topic. Uh, I think I'd just like to summarize uh, at, uh, at any cost, I think from test perspective, uh, we can work together with you uh, uh, from different industries and we can come together. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, if you need more information <laughs> about uh, any specific technology that you, you would like to talk about and uh, would be happy to give you more information on this. Yeah, that's, that's good for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aswin. And uh, we'll uh, jump right on to the next subject, which is uh, the um, smart mixed reality. And this topic will be discussed with uh, Philip Schwark, who's calling us from Germany as well, uh, and is the product owner for smart mixed reality. So uh, hello, Philip, and uh, uh, welcome on board. Um, so same as same as before, maybe the, the first question would be, can you can you tell us more about smart mixed reality, which, which has, I believe is, is also a trendy topic, the augmented reality and, and all this uh, basically technologies available on the market. So can you can you tell us more about what we've developed and what what it does exactly? Yes. Hello, Maxime. Um, so smart mixed reality or augmented reality are pretty similar and all of these technologies have the focus on enhancing the real world with additional data coming from um, other technologies like sensors, like uh, your CAD data, uh, technical drawings, um, some other ERP data coming. And so it's the goal by using uh, mixed reality or augmented reality to give more information to the consumers or to the users of the systems. So, if I start with my presentation here, one second. So the presentation is okay. Should be there now. Yes, we can okay, see your screen now. Um, so it started like uh, 2012 in Airbus when. Um, we have realized that augmented reality and mixed reality can improve our quality and pro, uh, production effect, uh, effectively and um, so that we can have a huge benefit by using this. So the main goal was at that time that we want to be paperless, so have to have a full digital production workflow 
and um, because in former we had our workers using technical drawings and um, they are quickly not anymore up to date and it's hard to orientate by using paper drawings which are in 2D and um, the worker or the users have to transfer this information to the real world data which is of course 3D and um, so since 2012 we have more than 900 users within the Airbus group and um, we have a lot of different use cases for example we are for the A380 um, and proofness of the um, quality check from three weeks to three days uh, by using the system. So this was, for example, for the bracket inspection within the aircraft. We can imagine that there are thousands of brackets installed within the aircraft. So, but as you see, this is uh, for the beginning was used within the commercial aircraft line, but it's now used as well within uh, the helicopter section or for the uh, satellite section. So um, there was already this transfer of the technology uh, of this, this innovative technology done Airbus internally to the different uh, divisions. And as we have already totally different um, needs there from the size of the um, assembly lines and so on, um, you can imagine that it's very easy to transfer as we have already set up a generic product. It is very easy to transfer this technology to other industries as well, where we have the production, for example, or trainings and so on. Um, and uh, in the end, the user has uh, uh, the possibility to receive additional information coming from augmented reality, virtual reality or mixed reality, um, for instance, like you can see in the image on the bottom right here. So we have the structure in the background, which is the real world data, and we have gathered additional information coming from CAD data here, uh, like the brackets you see here and so on, uh, which shall be installed, for example. So um, it enables the worker to tracks process to not so that he knows exactly where he shall install parts or inspect parts, for example. All right. And so um, what, what, what would you uh, what would you say uh, uh, have been the, the improvements, the benefit that you have noticed on, on the on the assembly lines in that case or the different use cases? Uh, where where this uh, mixed reality has been has been implemented okay so um the improvements are definitely what you can see already in the example of the speed um the second improvement is really for the orientation that people knows what to place for instance for the production side uh, in which direction so before there must have been uh, the possibility to have uh, the wrong orientation of the parts or just missing a part uh, placing the single part on a uh, wrong stringer because you have a lot of stringers there and uh, sometimes you count wrongs for example so we have a huge improve of quality as well so in total the costs increase the first time right uh, is there and we have improvement of quality and speed here by using the system, right? I guess I guess first time right is the best way best way to describe it. Is that, that there's no no longer uh, this this kind of error that you need to fix and and that generates uh, time loss and and therefore some some kind of extra cost. Um, uh, do do we have any, any any different use cases like non non related to to aviation or any idea where this could be implemented as well outside of the uh, of the Airbus world and the aviation industry? Yes, so um, if we come to the different use cases uh, or application areas here, so um, we have four main application areas uh, that we have and all of these uh, application areas can be just transfer to the other industry. So it's not aerospace specific because the first one that I have just explained is the installation. This is basically needed in all industries uh, where we have a production, for example. Um, the second one is uh, the inspection where we have quality inspections um, where you need to make sure that everything is installed correctly everything is in a correct space or maybe if you just have a quality walk through uh, the production and if you realize that there's something wrongly installed that is not on your to-do list for the uh, job for today, but you still can say, okay, I've seen that there's something wrong uh, in the pro uh, production. You can just 
place it uh, via augmented reality there, the error, you take a photo with the system and uh, you got everything gathered in one space here in the digital tool, like the photo of the problem you have found or like um, the coordinates, the real world coordinates uh, where the problem is so that you, the next person who shall fix the problem can easily find it. And everything is documented with photos and um, coordinates, text, and so on, or maybe speech as well, if it goes to the HoloLens. And um, this data or this output is a digital report. So uh, it's not meant to be to print this again directly. It's uh, more for transferring it to the next system. If we have one uh, for non-conformity management, for example, in place, then we can just transfer it there, read it there, and make sure that it's handled in a good way uh, by the next people. Um, so this report is already the third use case that it's good for the documentation with the photos and so on. Um, the fourth uh, use case is the training. So, for instance, if it comes to training, uh, you have uh, new workers in your production or um, for training, you can just have a full guidance by the system of what the user shall do, how they shall do, if there's the correct order, if you need, uh, for example, a specific uh, talks there uh, for the installation, and uh, you have a step-by-step -step guide to guarantee that everything is correctly done in a correct order. And uh, as you can see on the image on the bottom right, uh, we have as well a checklist there where you need to can or where you can prove every single step that it's done in a correct manner. And of course, this will uh, afterwards be in a report, and uh, this will be or can be double checked by external systems, by the engineering departments, and so on, to see okay, everything is done correctly, or um, maybe there is a following task needed to do this. So, for training, for working with procedure, procedures, uh, this is ideally and um, this are tasks that are, uh, need to be taken in all industries, not only within the aerospace. Okay, so so basically here we've got four different applications. Uh, and I would say that regardless of the use case or the industry, the way to implement it is through project mode, right? Because we need a, it, it requires certain level of collaboration with the, with the customer to, to implement this mixed reality solution. Is that so correct? Um, yes, for the beginning, it is needed to have um, collaboration with us so that you know to, or the customer knows to learn how the system works. Afterwards, after this implementation phase and uh, their engineering department learned how to use it, there's no involvement needed by Testia anymore. So what is really important to understand here is that the data the uh, holy grail, let's say, of data, the CAD data, where all the information for about their product is uh, contained, uh, that this data does not need to be transferred out of the network of the customers. So everything can be done autonomously by the customer without having um, any specific uh, development work on their side. So this is really a task that can be done by the internal existing engineering departments. So, so, yeah, I guess that, that's quite an important aspect, right? Is that uh, when, when we think about mixed reality, we assume that uh, the, the customer will have to share the, the, the DMU of its product or all the, all the information related to, to the, the design. And, and actually, maybe that's not so, so, so much required. And we can actually have mixed augmented reality without, uh, without that level of information, right? Yes, correct. Absolutely. Um, if I switch to the next slide, so this is, for example, an outcome that just an engineer from our side created without having any development knowledge. So this can be done after a couple of minutes training or half day training by each customer independently. So uh, what we have here is, for instance, for our smart scan, a guidance of what shall be installed and um, with additional part information like uh, part numbers, talk information or uh, what kind of screw they need to take. Um, we can turn it or use it in another way as well. If we have um, 
machine output from a manufacturing machine, for example, we can display via augmented reality as well the um, log information of it so that we have all information directly visualized on the product uh, at the correct space and with an orientation help like you can see here for instance the line going to the part you want to inspect or you want uh, you get the information to so that you have as well a guidance in there um, if we come to the point that you just asked as well how can it be uh, implemented or can it be used on the um, customer side so what we have here is on the one side on the first step here on the top we have the preparation of work orders so this is what needs to be done by the engineering department for instance so they need to define what kind of tasks shall be done uh, in the second step what kind of procedures do we have that we want to uh, digitalize um, in the end they take the digital mock-up data and they can select what parts what single parts or what part number range they want to inspect from their cad data and uh, then they can in the simplest most simple case they can just write down the part numbers in a list uh, they load the cad files um, and they can say convert or generate a work order and then afterwards it's already pushed to the worker on the, which you can see here on the bottom right so um, this is a whole process that can be done within the customer location based on their uh, data without a need after it is implemented and the users understood how it works to involve us for example we have uh, some customers that i see uh, maybe twice a year if it comes to an update that we uh, explain the new functionalities but they are fully autonomous and uh, do not need any support on those implementing new use cases uh, on their side for instance so we ne never see their data and uh, all we do is giving a training and everything is done internally so mm -hmm. The work order here on the bottom uh, is that the worker in the end has a full task list that uh, they need to do and uh, of course the goal is that they check every single part there within the task list so that they can prove that they have uh, a 100 uh, percent achieved of what they should do uh, what was before uh, prepared by the engineering department um, if we for example think about other industries or in other structures where um, it comes to maintenance for example uh, we have sometimes uh, things covered by uh, plates for instance and uh, you need to um, remove plates from the surface to see behind it let's say this can be already achieved as well uh, by the augmented reality that you have a look through the existing structure that you know which plate you exactly need to remove um, to have a fast and easy uh, repair for example and uh, everything is guided uh, by the system here like a gps system let's say like a navigation system you have in the car but when you come into your uh, new coordinates you get a uh, description of what you shall do here and where you need to go to to uh, find your new uh, next steps that you shall work and as explained before uh, to have the full round afterwards we have a documentation that comes to the engineering best and they can if it's needed prepare a new followed link task here right so so basically uh, mixed document smart mixed reality sorry basically means providing a technician with additional information on his environment with uh, data coming from uh, from the dmu coming from uh, specifications um, so Typically, how how is it displayed for for the for the technician? Because uh, on your slides we see that there's a tablet, for example, with a camera showing additional information on the screen. Are there any other ways to to display the information? Yes, so um, what you had seen here before, so this uh, was done by taking a snapshot on the HoloLens. So everything is, the HoloLens are the glasses, so you can really see everything and you have your hands free. This is the one possibility you can use. The second one is that you have a tablet really in your hand and uh, with a tracking camera connected and you can 
uh, just move around and you have all the information displayed on the tablet. So it's really important as well for us to have a high acceptance by the users that they can select because some people do not like to use the, uh, to use the HoloLens, some others do not like the tablet usage. So they can freely pick what they want to use and they can always just load the same work package, the same description, and it's, uh, can, they can either use the HoloLens or the uh, tablet. We have other use cases as well, where we have a station uh, for the assembly, where we have projectors in place. So um, imagine that you have a fixed assembly station and where you just place new um, items that you want to install. In this case, we have a projector that's just projecting all the information coming here or that you can see here directly on the um, parts that you want to install. Mm. All right. Okay, so so different ways to to have the information displayed uh, depending on what the the user prefers, basically, but but the information would be similar. Yes. Um, so so maybe coming back to to the value, the benefits of implementing uh, smart uh, sorry a smart mixed reality. Um, we we mentioned that the initial one was first time right, so basically not not generating any rework or any uh, any repair. Um, I guess other aspects would be maybe making life easier for the for the technician, having having uh, more ergonomy and, and the, the simplifying the workflow. Yes, absolutely. So uh, what we have realized in the production here that it's a really very high acceptance by the users of the system. So uh, they were used before uh, to use paper drawings uh, with the 2D information and uh, they were really happy to use the new system and uh, there was not a lot of uh, work or there was almost no work to do to bring the system to the users because they wanted to use it and they have directly seen the benefits by using it. And um, from other systems, sometimes we uh, have the experience within the IT that it's hard to get the acceptance by the users, but that wasn't a, or isn't a problem at all here as it brings a lot of benefits to the end users and to the whole value chain that we have in the production. Okay, all right. So, so basically uh, productivity improvement and uh, high acceptance from the, from the users. So generates uh, more, more cost savings, more productivity, all these kind of, uh, of benefits from from implementing those two solutions yes um, correct. Okay. and uh, and additionally uh, that the engineering departments are completely independently able to implement new use cases without having uh, software development done uh, mm -hmm. additionally to implement this new use case and um, as well without ha the need to hand the data to external uh, companies to implement a use case all right so, so here if the, in the audience, if, if there was anyone with uh, an ID of use case or with uh, a potential development uh, needed, uh, we, they could basically contact us and we would work together on how to make the most of the uh, mixed augmented reality to, to, to have it work on different use cases. Definitely. We have a lot of work uh, use cases already implemented. There's a, a huge uh, user base where we have learned from and uh, we have to, uh, brought a, a lot of new features over the last eight years to the system. So that there's a, really a lot of engineering knowledge in the system uh, so that you can use the system for really small structures, but as well for large structures. So the smaller ones like smaller satellites or a whole aircraft. So if you combine it, we can directly implement it for our example for for uh, shipyards, for windmills, for uh, trains, for example, uh, to bring it there, but as well for smaller ones. So uh, the system is really extremely flexible to adapt it to other industries mm -hmm. and to transfer it to other industries and uh, due to our uh, knowledge, how to implement it and how to help uh, the engineering department to be benefit uh, from the system independently. And um, we can easily enable industries, other industries to use the system. Okay. Okay, I guess that pretty much cover it. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Philip. Maybe and, and if you want to add a, like a short conclusion or just a few words, something we didn't mention, and, and then we, we can move on to the Q&A. 
I think really that the uh, data is the key benefit that you need your own data that you have full control over data like CAD data. If you do not have the CAD data, we can help you to create the CAD data as well from your existing structures. And um, this is the key that you have control that you can create and set up new use cases completely independently without the need to have a full project for every single use case. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, and we are now done with the four topics of the day. So um, I guess that what we've covered today is all, all sorts of different technologies of, of uh, uh, innovations we've been working on. And probably one, one key message here is that uh, some of those solutions are kind of off the shelf. We would, would need some of sort of adjustment, a bit of work to make them uh, uh, having other, other purposes. But some of them are already implemented through some kind of project modes with a full collaboration with the customer. And therefore, I also not only dedicated to uh, aviation, even though we are uh, we are working with uh, aviation in the first place. But those solutions could actually be implemented in, in any kind of industries, right? Um, so uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if uh, if uh, Dr. Babu wants to say a few words as well, uh, and and we can move on to the Q&A session. Uh, so I, I didn't really follow the chat in the Q&A, but uh, I will check it right now. And if you have any questions, feel free to write them down uh, to, to, uh, to have them here. Uh, so, Dr. Babu, did you want to say a, a few words before we move on to the Q&A? Okay. So, so no, no answer from Babu, from Dr. Babu. So, uh, I've got one question here, which is, uh, what kind of support uh, Testia provide to implement industrial solutions? So. Um, I'm not sure who, who wants to take that one. Maybe uh, Teddy, do you want to answer the question here? Uh, sure. So uh, you can hear me, I, I guess. Yes. Good. Uh, well, it's a very uh, broad question. So just uh, to make a, a short answer for industrial solution, what we like to do, what we are used to do, and what we prefer to do is really uh, uh, to be uh, an end-to-end -end partner. So the support we provide in general for uh, an industrial solution is from the very beginning, from the design, even if the solution is made for new parts, we can even help you to design the part based on the entity constraints and spectability constraints. So we can come at the very early stages, uh, run the project for you and with you, uh, define together the specifications, help you define the specification. If you have already your specification, this is very fine. Translate them into a technical solution uh, and the technical architecture. Integrate this architecture. So we are a full integrator for you. So this is a support we need to provide. Deliver it. And then this is not where it, where it ends, but this is really where it starts. Then keep on accompanying on uh, going with you uh, in terms of uh, deployment, in terms of running even the industrial system. We we have uh, end to end solutions where we operate the system, train your operators, do the qualification, do the certification, and even after. Uh, do the audits. So it can really be from the beginning until the end. And this is what we prefer to do uh, so that we really have uh, no prejudice, let's say. We, uh, we are looking at the overall scope and we try to find the best solution. If the best solution is to provide a solution plus our inspector, we do it. If the best solution is to train your people and make your operators do it, this is what we do. Well, we try to find the best solution uh, in an end-to-end -end manner. Okay. Thank you, Teddy. Welcome. Um, there's there's a question for I guess that's for Aswin about uh, about structural health monitoring, uh, saying that uh, so we implemented for bridges, for wind turbine, uh, and, and for blades. Uh, also says that composites have many defects: fiber breaking, uh, pull out, matrix tracking, delamination, etc. Uh, and uh, the detection of this 
is is predictive uh, and the, that the crack is actually the consequence of it so uh i guess the question here would be that could ac chain be be implemented as well for for composite materials mm -hmm. Uh, so I think there's two two points here yeah? uh, when we think about uh, structure health monitoring. First one is to uh, detect, and the second one is to make sense of what is being detected. Like for example, if it is a fiber cracking or matrix, uh, so it's it's sort of two different lines, but obviously they are linked to each other. Uh, yes, um, the answer in general would be yes. We do have uh, solutions right now in our portfolio where we we talk about composite structures, be it uh, carbon fiber composites or glass fiber composites in the wind turbine industry. Um, uh, maybe I can I can uh, I can share my screen if I have the ball, but if not, I, oh. I can also um, give a broad um, rough idea about what. I'll, kind of I'll give you the ball. Sure, no that, that'll be uh, great. Uh, yes. You should have it there. Sure. Excellent. So you you should be you should be able to see some of the solutions here, yeah, which which we we identified to be um, the key solutions for aviation. Of course, it's not limited to these uh, solutions, but these are some of them that we have uh, previously worked with for even composites. Uh, so here you see some of the techniques like Acousto ultrasound. Essentially, is a piezoelectric patch which sends sound signals, uh, detecting delamination. It could detect a uh, fiber damages and so on and so forth that this area is basically like a UT but it is it's smart enough to actually send signals and receive signals and make assessments of the kind of defects that's been uh, generated uh, I would jump into the second type of sensor which is here the optical fiber sensor so uh, just just to make sure that we are all clear there are some sensor technologies here which may not be directly applicable to composites but I'm just pointing out at the ones that um, clearly do so uh, I think one of the key techniques that we have worked with a lot, in fact, is optical fiber sensors. So for a lot of applications with composite um, um, being, you know, prime importance nowadays, the use of optical fiber sensors has been higher because they can sort of be embedded or integrated within the composites to form like um, a unit uh, to sense the behavior of the, the composite, uh, be it uh, delamination, uh, cracking, or even uh, monitoring the curing process, yeah, even from the manufacturing side all the way to the service side. Uh, and and um, yeah, so these are some of them. Of course, we can provide uh, conventional sensors that can monitor the, the behavior of the composite as well, uh, apart from these sensors. Uh, but I would like to believe that structure health monitoring is more of a, a tool boss application. So it's, it's clearly, first, if we clearly understand what is the end goal, of what is to be measured or how much, what is the accuracy of uh, measurement and things like that. I think the wish list needs to be very clear before we look into the, the sensor technologies. Um, and this is my belief. So if um, the, the person who has asked this question, uh, he can write to us, uh, we would be happy to have like a one-on-one -on -one session where we could define, let's say the wish list um, we, we could identify the, the key pain points from that particular industry sector, and we can try to tailor make the solution uh, based on this this particular uh, requirement. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I, I guess there's a there's a second question uh, on the on the same topic, which is mm -hmm. uh, can, can ACHM be used for on buildings, for example? So we use uh, yeah, it on, on on aircraft. So. Absolutely, absolutely. It can also be used on uh, buildings. Again, it depends clearly on what is the thing that you need to measure from these buildings. Um, um, there's been a lot of history for structure health monitoring on buildings, um, especially during ma uh, manufacturing or let's say mm. building a, a huge tower, for example, to make sure that the strain levels are um, um, within the limits at different flows. Uh, this is one of the applications. So you use conventional sensors, mostly like strain gauges, or you can use even therm thermal gauges uh, to ensure the, the temperature uh, patterns, humidity as well. And these are some of the conventional systems. Uh, but I think 
nowadays people are also moving towards using optical fiber sensors uh, because it provides a larger mm -hmm. measurement uh, region so you can measure over a given region the the distribution of strain or distribution of temperature this is also i think something that we can work towards with the knowledge that we have in aerospace which is something that we can impart into uh, new domains like uh, uh, let's say a building uh, i think apart from that there is also damages like for example if there is a crack on a on, on concrete for example we can have sensors you can imagine it as like band-aids for cracks yeah but it's not obviously healing these cracks but it's monitoring the cracks to make sure they don't grow and this is another aspect this is something that we can work uh, with the solutions that we have already to implement uh, let's say fiber optic sensors going across the crack and making sure that the strain levels are not uh, so high that the, that the crack is growing um, yeah these are some of the examples yes right there's a there's another one for you as win sure. uh, so i'm reading it uh, at the same time so mm -hmm. uh, if, if acoustic emission inspection is being used for uh, in-service operation, off-service, uh, subsurface defect detection for composite inspections, uh, what proven expertise has in this field, on, on this field, and uh, only a section for bridges, wind turbine blades was seated for cracks? Uh, can you repeat the question? I, I think, uh, um, yeah. I, I also, I'm not sure I understand the, the question as well, but I guess the question is about a subsurface defect detection for, for composite, for example, uh, and asking what, what expertise this has in this, in mm -hmm, this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for subsurface, um, from our, our standpoint, I think the simplest solution that can go uh, below the surface would be something like an ultrasound wave so that you can sort of track the wave and you can know what kind of defects is below it. Uh, so acoustic emission or acousto ultrasonic, which is basically an active sensor compared to an acoustic emission, it can uh, send waves which is then detected back and then you can make some assessment. Obviously the depth of how much you can detect is another uh, question by itself. Uh, it depends on the sensor that has been chosen. Uh, but in case we have a good idea about what kind of depth are we talking about, we can always embed, uh, which is during the manufacturing process of the composite, embed fiber optic sensors. These sensors are essentially um, um, light tubes, so light passes through these tubes, and when there's a delamination, when there's a crack, um, the, the, these tubes elongate or compress, and the change in the propagation of light is then translated into strain or temperature values. And so we could also imagine um, um, installing sensors uh, during the manufacture for critical components to ensure that uh, you know even the curing process in this case for composites can be monitored or in fact uh, post curing to to make sure that during the service uh, there's no cracks or anything like this that is developed we can we can also use so yes we do have experience uh, in a lot of the technologies but most of the use cases are derived from aerospace and related so if uh, the person who has asked the question has a particular use case in mind it'll be great that they can contact us and we can always try to you know touch grounds on what they would like to hear from us and we, we can we can try to tailor make something for them yeah all right Thank you. Thank you very much, Aswin. I no think problem. the uh, next question would be more for Alexander uh, about uh, the composite inspection. Uh, Alexander, you're still here. Um, the question is how ET works for composite because uh, a UT ET device was uh, was seated. Uh, uh, so I think the, here there was no ET inspection for composite. That was that was all ultrasonic. Um, DLAM tool for composites, gonna go, what technology what technology is used for scanning and what's the resolution of the matrix? And I'll, I'll send, there's another question, but uh, first maybe let's answer to that one. About the technology. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, I believe the UTET uh, inspection that uh, the, the person is talking about is the UE1 box, uh, which can also be coupled to uh, another solution that we have. It's more for a dual use. Uh, it's just that we have the two possibilities within uh, one box. Um, now let's switch to questions regarding the, the DLAN tool. So um, how it works actually, uh, the system uh, will uh, be looking in the first few layers of uh, the composite structure 
uh, from 0.2 to 1.5 uh, millimeters for any delamination. So you might ask, yeah, but what if uh, a crack is uh, further into the, the, the composite structure? Uh, well, that's the reason why it's uh, for a dedicated use, because we consider the use case was after a shock. Well, after a shock, the delamination, you will find it right uh, behind the surface. Uh, so that is why the system starts by looking in the most, uh, the nearest, closest to the surface uh, layers of the composite structure before uh, going uh, more uh, deeply uh, into the mm. structure if necessary. All right, thanks. The, the other question was for the line sizing uh and uh asking what what technology uh, does it use uh well uh, it's actually the this uh, quite the same as the one uh, i've been i've explained for uh the dlam tool it's uh ut ultrasonic and uh to do the mapping it will um we've set uh, a handful of uh, of doors to catch the the echoes uh from different um different surfaces and the same as the the DLAM tool it will start by looking by the by the foremost uh, the closest um, the closest zone the closest surface layers and will go deeper if uh, any uh, if any damage is found okay all right thank you very much Alexander yeah. next question uh, is about industry 4.0 uh, Teddy yeah, Teddy, if you're still here, um, the question is, can uh, testing be monitored online without physical testing? Can testing be monitored online without physical testing? Okay, so this is not only, I guess, about digital continuity. Uh, uh, it's also uh, about what we discussed about IFP, I guess, and uh, and, uh, and TFF. So yeah, that's really our goal. I don't really know what's behind the question, but that's really our goal. Uh, we have two big pillars in terms of a future strategy for Testia. One is uh, making the inspection as easy as possible in post-process. This is using GoNoGo, -no -Go, this is using all of the digital continuity tools, digital continuity tools. And another aspect is in process, indeed. Uh, and in process monitoring. And by doing this, like CFF, we can then do it post-process. Like for the CFF, we do uh, the censoring, uh, we use the sensors that can be reused after during the post-process, the post -process, during the in-service. So yeah, we, we really do believe in uh, the post-process monitoring and the in-process monitoring, embedding yeah. already sensors for uh, the future that can be reused through structural and monitoring and so on. Yeah. And maybe to, just to add something to, to what you mm -hmm. said, because I think the question was also concerning uh, inspection 4.0. So I guess one aspect is that uh, the testing will have to be done physically at some point, but the idea with gathering the data and having them available somewhere on, on a cloud platform or a different software uh, means that someone else with a different uh, level of access was like uh, someone that needs to approve the task to approve the repair could do that remotely from his computer just by checking the data available in the data that has been provided thanks to the inspection so that's that's something that can be done remotely yeah. as well. and, uh, and another aspect as well by doing this digital continuity and this online monitoring our goal is basically to uh, reduce the workload so that we can increase the focus I think this is a, a key aspect so that we don't have to inspect most of the industries which are represented today uh, are using big assets, big wind turbines, big uh, tubes, uh, big pipes, big uh, boats. And often then we require a lot of large areas inspections uh, which are not necessarily uh, needed for the full area. So with all of uh, this online monitoring, the SHM, what we hope is that the experts, the level two, the level three can really focus on the spurious area, the suspicious area, and we can remove the easy work. We can remove the non-added value work. All right, thanks, Teddy. Um, one one more question about uh, uh, smart mixed reality. So that's that's for Philip. Um, and the question is that 
how can augmented reality work securely with secret sites like uh, like for military companies for example okay so um Smart mixed reality, after what I've explained before, before the creation of the work package, so everything will stay within the company and can be handled in their internal network on their own internal computers. So there is no connection needed to the internet at all. So the only connection you might need is between the client using the work package, the data, to open the described tasks and the engineering to save their data. But you could even do this manually by copying it uh, via a secure drive, for example. So um, for, for military data, there's absolutely no risk as it never touches an external network. Uh, only your internal own secured network uh, will transfer the data. All right. Thanks, Philip. There's one question coming back from, from Aswin. Uh, about uh, about SHM, um, and the question is: How can customers test capabilities of SHM without a huge investment in the first place? That's a good point and a good question. I think uh, uh, from our perspective, uh, and I think um, um, it was also previously mentioned, we would like to take uh, things step by step. Yeah. So when mm -hmm. we we have a customer, of, of course, you don't have to make a long. A large investment to start off with but when when you partner with us we can start off from the basic idea of discussing as to whether or how feasible is structure health monitoring for that particular use case starting with this process and for this is more, mostly like a couple of meetings but then we can also derive um, some based on the wish list we at Testia, we can provide a benchmarking, uh, looking at different solutions, coming up with let's let's say uh, the best fit for this particular wish list, which can then be driven to uh, start a feasibility study where we can perform. Let's say um, it could be on field tests or it could be laboratory tests, depending upon the use case, and we could do it in a much smaller scale to make sure that what we what we are proposing actually has a feasible solution and we can slowly go from that to a demonstration phase where we can demonstrate on a uh, maybe a, a, a model which is a little bit scaled down from the actual model if it is a bridge maybe on a small section of the bridge uh, and then go into the full scale implementation so we can uh, we can ensure that uh, we when we work with the customer we we both benefit from each other by uh, going through the step by step process and uh, we are all aware of every uh, aspect, uh, every move that we make, uh, each of us make, yeah. Yes. Thanks, Aswin. I, I guess that that's basically the, the, this step-by-step -step approach is, is the way to describe the, the, the way we would uh, implement solutions, not only for SHM, but for all the solutions, for, for smart mixed reality, that would also be step-by-step, -step. for uh, the digital continuity, We'll start with some bricks, and then uh, further so further on the way we can add bricks and interconnect everything. So it's all a step-by-step -step approach, and it doesn't have to be a massive investment in the beginning to see uh, the benefits from from that from those technologies. Absolutely, yeah. All right. So uh, I think we are reaching the end of this uh, this seminar. We only have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask if there's any final thoughts from the from the audience. Uh, if someone wants to add a few words, and then we we can do the closing. So um, maybe uh, Teddy, if you want to uh, just uh, add a few words before before we conclude that that seminar. Sure. Thanks a lot. So yeah, my my words uh, my concluding words uh, would be uh, once again a big thanks. To uh, NDTS, to Dr. Babu for this uh, opportunity, to Aswin for uh, being the link into this, to the organization. Uh, well done uh, to you, Maxime, to Adrian, to all of the participants and, pa and panelists. Uh, I hope for the uh, participants this was uh, a quality webinar and you could get information uh, useful for your industry, for your daily work. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, what we wanted to share today is uh, our perspective within aerospace of what, uh, where we are going and what we are doing at the moment in NDT that could be useful to you. Uh, once again, we think we share similar values, which are uh, the common ground for collaboration. 
So uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we would be extremely uh, happy to work with you on uh, some uh, exciting projects with love technology and challenges. So uh, let's try to find uh, nice topics uh, uh, to work on together. Right. Thanks, Teddy. And uh, yes, once again, I'd like to thank uh, to thank everyone for joining that that seminar. Uh, thank you very much to NDTSS for making the the, the arrangements and contacting the, the members of the of the organization. And uh, and also thank you very much to to my colleagues for joining that event and for providing their expert view on those different topics. So I hope it was full of fruitful information. And uh, if you want in the audience to, to investigate further, to discuss more on those topics, um, we, can, we are also open in organizing specific webinars on, uh, on those topics to, to give further information, to, to dig more into the details and explore exactly how that could be uh, implemented in other types of industries. So please uh, do contact us if you have any ID, anything you'd like to explore. Otherwise, uh, We'll we'll wrap up now, and uh, just uh, I'd like uh, I'm just thanking you everyone again for joining it, and we can uh, uh, I look forward to see you all again.